almost 2,000 years ago, truth was put on trial and judged by people who were devoted to lies. In fact, truth faced six trials in less than one day, three of which were religious and three that were legal of a nature. In the end, few people involved in these events could answer the question, what is truth? After being arrested, truth was first led to a man named Annas, a corrupt former high priest of the Jews. Annas broke numerous Jewish laws during the trial, including holding the trial in his house, trying to induce self-accusations against the defendant, striking the defendant, who had been convicted of nothing at the time. After Annas, the truth was led to the reigning high priest, Caiaphas, who happened to be Anna's son-in-law. Before Caiaphas and the Jewish Sanhedrin, many false witnesses came forward to speak against the truth. But nothing could be proved and no evidence wrongdoing could be found. Caiaphas broke no fewer than seven laws while trying to convict the truth. One, the trial was held in secret. Two, it was carried out at night. Three, it involved bribery. Four, the defendant had no one to make a defense against him for him. Five, the requirement of two or three witnesses could not be met. Six, they used self-incriminating testimony against the defendant. And seven, they carried out the death penalty against the defendant on the same day. All these actions were prohibited by Jewish law. Regardless, Caiaphas declared the truth guilty because the truth claimed to be God in the flesh, something Caiaphas called blasphemy. When morning came, the third trial of the truth took place with the result that the Jewish Sanhedrin pronounced that the truth should die. However, the Jewish consul had no legal right to carry out the death penalty, so they were forced to bring the truth to the Roman governor at the time, a man named Pontius Pilate. Pilate was appointed by Tiberius as the fifth prefect of Judea and served in that capacity from A.D. 26 to 36. The procurator had power of life and death and could reverse capital sentences passed by the Sanhedrin. As the truth stood before Pilate, more lies were brought against him. His enemy said, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding the paid taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the king. And this was a lie. The truth had told everyone to pay their taxes, and never spoke of himself as a challenge to Caesar. And after this, a very interesting conversation between the truth and Pilate took place. Scripture says, Therefore Pilate entered again in the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so they would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered and said, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Pilate said to him, What is truth? What is truth? It's kind of an excerpt of an article I found. I found it in more than one place as I was studying. and cannot fully establish the author, and so I would acknowledge it. But we recently finished a series on Jesus' high priestly prayer, and shortly before Christ prayed, he said to his disciples this in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then when he prayed regarding his disciples, and we saw us as well, he prays this to the Father. John 17, 16, and following, 
they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. The truth was put on trial and found guilty, pronounced guilty by a lie. The irony of that. The world rejected truth, crucified truth, murdered truth, buried truth, but the world could not keep truth in the grave. And Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. One of the most, we find the most deepest and most important doctrinal truths in John, the least of which is John 1 and following. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then we see 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We could go home right there, full of grace and truth, happy. Full of grace and truth. Sometimes in this sad world we live in, what they they call truth will be condemning. You didn't do this, you didn't do this, but God is full of truth, but grace is well. And we live in a world that is still trying to kill the truth. We live in a world that is trying to redefine truth. And we live in a world that rejects Jesus the Christ, Jesus the truth. We live in a world that will water down the truth in your life if you let it. And we are called to follow Jesus, which is the same as following the truth. The word. As a follower of Christ, as a follower of the truth, you were called to a higher standard than the world. And the truth is, it's not always easy to answer that call. Because the truth will make you accountable. So many times it's far easier not to be accountable. Because lies reduce our accountability. And there's something about the beauty of God's church, both his universal church in the world and the corporate church or the local church, I guess. Beauty of the church is that not, we're not called to walk through this life alone as we follow the truth. And part of the reason that Christ established his church is that we would be here for one another. When God first called me to this church many years ago, one of the first things we did was define who we were and what we stood for. We've often said it begins with our name, New Hope Christian Fellowship. It was not by mistake. There was a lot of prayer, and we believe God's intervention in that name. But New Hope, God's restoration of hope in our lives, this new hope that we can walk in, His mercies are new every day. New Hope Christian, a clear declaration of who we proclaim as Lord. And fellowship, adjoining a community of believers in Christ following the truth. And fellowship is one of those church words. You don't really hear it outside the church much. You know, and you don't hear I'm going to a fellowship or we're going to fellowship. It's a church word. Well, we do see and read fellowship in Scripture. It's translated from the Greek word koinonia, and it means, amongst other things, partnership, participation, fellowship, and communion. Commentator and author Lawrence Richards calls koinonia an intimate sharing of our lives with God and each other. An intimate sharing of our lives with God and each other. Koinonia has deep biblical roots. 1 Corinthians translates it, the communion of the body and blood of Christ. The Bible tells us we're called into fellowship in the gospel and in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also read that we're called into the comfort and fellowship with the Holy Spirit and fellowship with the saints and ministry to the saints, fellow believers. Philippians 3.10 informs us that, that we may know Christ 
in the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. We want to know Christ in the powership of his resurrection. We struggle in this fellowship of his sufferings. And yet we don't walk through this life without having some trials or difficulties. So just scratching the word, we begin to see there's so much more to fellowship than we might see on the surface. We had a picnic yesterday. We fellowship over food, right? It always brings people together. <laughs> but I think it's easy to miss the awesome privilege that God is calling us to. We have a daily invitation. We get invitations in the mail for whatever. Imagine if you re received an invitation that said this. Put your own name in there. Dear Mr. and Miss, insert your name. You are cordially invited to come into the presence and fellowship of God in order that you may know him intimately. Please RSVP. How many would respond to that? Save the date, right? Can it be today? And 1 John does an incredible job of illuminating this for us. See this in 1 John 1 and 1 following. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one is who is life itself was revealed to us, and we've seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. An incredible rich section of Scripture. There's so much going on here. There can almost be a series in this whole thing. How he calls them the word of life, the depth of meaning behind that. And, and he talks about, we've seen him and touched him with our own hands. There was a lot of heresy going around this time. A lot of false teachers coming to the church, trying to separate the church. And part of it was, God could never be a human being. It's all God could ever do that. And Jesus was never a real man and, and all this stuff. Oh, I've heard from God and all this mystical stuff. And they say, no, we've seen the truth. We've seen the Messiah. We've touched him with our own hands. We spent time with him. And then we get this incredible invitation that we'd have fellowship with him. I mean, that's a wonderful invitation to understand the revelation of the Father so that your joy may be complete. To understand the truth so that your joy may be complete, may be full, completed. And immediately following this invitation comes a clarifier by the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we heard from Jesus, and now I'll declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness we are not practicing the truth. It's very easy to say you have fellowship with God and you have fellowship with him, you know him. It's easy to say, but God puts it to the test. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, living our lives according to the world's standard, we are lying to ourselves and to God. In other words... Are you walking like you're talking or talking like you wish you were walking? Verse 7 is a rather intimidating qualifier. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. But if, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, I don't know about you, but as hard as I may try, I don't always walk in the light that Christ is in the light. It's a qualifier, but what do we do with this? There's some harsh things. I wouldn't, harsh is the wrong word. Strong truths being declared here. 
And we may struggle to live to. So how does it impact us as we follow the truth? I don't always walk in the light as Jesus did. Do you? Always? And see, John understand this. He's proclaiming this truth, but he related to the struggle. And we know it by the very following verses. Verse 8 and following. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And the verse that we love and confess all the time is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've pulled verse 9 apart many times. Thank God for first, verse 9. Our faithful, just, and purifying Lord Jesus Christ. So John starts out this epistle by saying he proclaimed Christ to them, to us, that we may have fellowship with the believers and them. And it's not a surface fellowship. This is a rather significant fellowship. You can have fellowship with John is saying with the disciples and with other believers, but did you notice who they're hanging around with? Verse 3 of 1 John 1. And that which we have seen and heard declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Hey, we're getting a group together tomorrow. You're welcome to come. I uh, hope you can make it, by the way. God the Father and Jesus will be there with us. We're going to be hanging out. How many would show up? Amen? But that's a daily invitation to you. We have an invitation every day to the world. Come participate in the world. Lower your standards. Make excuses. Satisfy your flesh. Or let's come hang out with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we're Satisfying our flesh, we don't really want to talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? Ooh, got quiet in here. <laughs> when you understand the true meaning of fellowship, then you begin to see the honor and the privilege you have of fellowship with the Father and the Son. There's such a beauty in it. Hopefully we'll see it as we walk through it. And this is a fellowship, a relationship that will keep you in the truth keep you in light and away from the darkness of the evil one. Look again at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's a, that's a choice in our part, right? If you walk in the light, you have a choice. But as we walk in the light of Christ, light always overcomes darkness. And light always reveals truth. So then, as we walk in the light of Jesus Christ, when we fall and stumble, we're quicker to admit it. Quicker to see the truth and repent. We walk in the ways of the world and we get confused and we get caught up with it, but we're really in the presence of God, walking with Him. We fall and stumble that way you would do. Even John said, if you say you don't have any sin, you're lying, you're deceiving yourself. But when that sin comes, you're, you're quickly convicted, quickly repentant. And there's that grace of God, full of grace and truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Not acknowledging our sins is denial, and that's to lie and walk in darkness. And, and the beauty here, in the context, the walking in his original language is present tense. It's happening now. It's not a casual relationship with Christ now and again and come to church occasionally. It's a daily walking present tense. When we're in God's presence, I've probably mentioned this many times over the years, but I came as an incredible understanding years ago. I choose how much time I want to spend with God. I choose how much time I want to be in His presence. And we understand as believers that God never leaves us or forsake us. But we choose how much time we want to be aware of His presence. Ever been with somebody and kind of ignore them, not pay much attention to them? None of you ever been driving in a car with somebody you had a difficulty with your mate and it's almost as if they're not there, you know what I'm saying? 
I mean, we choose how much time we want to spend in the presence of God. It's present tense. And as we're walking the light, the light and presence of Christ, your sins become evident. We turn to Christ in repentance, and Scripture said His blood purifies us from all sin. And while that's a, a truth of salvation, that God's blood, Christ's blood, will save everybody that comes to Him, these sections, this part of Scripture was written to believers. People that have already accepted Christ. What do we do with our sin once we've gotten saved. That's why the if in verse 9, if we confess our sins, is determined by if we're walking in the light. And the question is not whether you're going to sin. It's what you're going to do about it when you do. What do you do about it is greatly impacted by staying in the light of Jesus Christ. Now, if your lifestyle is one of habitually sinning, with little or no regard to true repentance, you may say you have fellowship with God, but God is not going to agree with you. This is not saying that you may say you know Christ, you have fellowship with Christ, and whenever you sin, oh, you've just been lying about it. No, it's saying you're going to need to repent as you're walking and have fellowship. But if you go on sinning all the time and pay really no attention, don't kid yourself and say you have fellowship with God. We know that when we accept Christ, he comes and lives within us. But when that happens, there should be a significant difference in your life, a noticeable difference. We all come to Christ at different places and walks in our lives. I had a fellow I knew, a preacher years ago. He talked about when he was in his early, late teens, middle teens, and he was a good kid. His parents always thought he was a great kid. There were any problems. And he got saved. He came home, I got saved. And he's trying to tell his parents, and I said, you know, that's nice, you know. I came to Christ much later in my teens, and in my life was a significant difference because of where I was and all the junk I was involved in, all the stuff was happening in my life. So God came in and made a, a remarkable difference in my life. But regardless of where you're walking, if you picture yourself without Christ, walking through this world, accepting Christ, Christ and coming living within you, there should be a noticeable difference in your life. There should be changes ongoing. For years now, there are several studies that have shown there's a growing disinterest in America's coming to church. They've done considerable research as to why. Several factors. But the one that is most striking is that people don't see much difference in those who claim to be a believer than those that don't. Man, that's convicting. Reacher says this, many in the United States who identify as Christians do so only superficially. These cultural Christians use the term but do not practice the faith. So we're supposed to follow the truth, follow Christ. And all too often, some of those who call themselves Christians come off as hypocrites to others. I'm not saying you're doing that. I'm just telling you what's happening in America. If Christ is real, and he is, and if our faith is real, then it should show. And it should show not because you want to appear spiritual or appear spiritual to others, because you're really trying to submit your life to Christ the best you can in this ongoing process. We stumble and fall, and the forgiver is right there with us. Now, John clarifies this even further in chapter 2. He writes, My dear children, what a term of endearment. I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if one does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. I mean, it's not a license to sin, but it's an avenue of repentance and forgiveness. Well, some of you may be struggling with this this morning, wondering where you stand in all this, surveying your life and trying to figure out exactly how this fits in with you. Sometimes you may feel like you're doing well, and then you continue to fall, and you can begin to question your walk. 
question how God feels about you. It's not uncommon. And the following verses help us so much. 1 John 2, 3 and following. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. We know that we have come to know him. What a beautiful statement. And the word know here, in the original language, means absolute knowledge. It's a surety, a resolved knowing. The low Nita Greek English lexicon helps us with this. It says this. We know we have come to know him, means this. To learn to know a person through direct personal experience, implying a continuity of relationship. To know, to become acquainted with, to be familiar with. In translating know in John here, it is important to avoid an expression which merely means to learn about. Here the emphasis must be on the interpersonal relationship, which is experience. We know we've come to know them because we experience it. We walk through life with them. We know them in a greater way, even as we stumble and fall and come back, or times when we spit in his wonderful presence. But Scripture is saying that you, that you could know that you know God. In verse 3, notice it says that we have come to know him. That's a progression. We read this too legally and we say, well, if we ever sin, I, I don't know God. I've been kidding myself all along. No, it's saying there's a progression here. You should know him through personal relationship experience. It's not telling you that your experience is divine scripture. It's saying you're personal experiencing with God, allowing scripture to line up your life. You come to know him better. It's a progressive thing. We start somewhere, we have a significant change in our life, and we continue to know him in a greater fashion. And don't you realize we all know as we know Christ better, we have less sin in our life. And when we know him better and have less in our life, when we do sin, we're quicker to say, you know what, I'm wrong. We might have defined, defended ourselves before, but now we say, I blew it. I want to clarify it. When you first accepted the finished work of Christ, when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, I want you to understand, immediately when you accept him, you then know him, and he knows you and proclaims you as one of his own. But at the same time, there was maturity, a deepening of your relationship and your character that grows as you walk with God. The more you and I walk in the light, the more we will know, learn of, and understand God. The more of God's truth you have in your life, the more truth. The more of God's light you have in your life, rather, the more truth you have in life. The more of God's light that you walk in in your life, the more truth you'll have in your life. We all have a daily choice to walk in light or walk in darkness. And, and what I love here is John is not pulling any punches here. Now, we've we got to see who John is. This is not some strict legalist. I mean, this guy was a lover of Christ. He suffered incredible things. Isle of Patmos, bringing all the things and, and all these trials he had. He had one of the deepest relationships with Jesus of any. He laid his head on Christ's chest, you know, and he was this possible love. You read 1 John, as we learn about love. It's believed, not scripturally, but historically, they say he lived to be the oldest. He had a Bible school. I mean, he's an incredible man, a man of love. But I love the fact that he doesn't pull any punches. Because you can speak the truth in love. How many times have I said, you can confront things without being confrontational. We hear the word confrontational. Oh, I avoid confrontation. I don't like to hear that word. Or some people like, bring it on, I love a good fight, you know. And usually the two are married to each other. One doesn't, one doesn't. But that's, that's for another day. <laughs> but you can confront things without being confrontational. I need to deal with it. And here's John, this apostle of love, saying, hey, guess what? There's some things we need to deal with because love speaks the truth. 
He's either, he is saying either you walk in the light or you walk in darkness. And he makes it clear the choices are if we walk in the light. And John is saying, if you say you know God, behave like it. It's a call to obedience to God's word. And it's not surprising when you understand John's walk. He was there. He started by saying he had seen Jesus. He touched him. He was there. John was in the upper room when he heard Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's not something that John read in school. It's what he heard from Christ. And he issues a call to obedience and then reveals that when you answer that call, you move into a deeper knowledge of God and a deeper knowledge of your relationship with him. You gain knowledge by obedience. John says, we know, we know him by obedience. It's a process. In the original language, the words that John chose when he wrote this reveal that he is referring to a growing obedience to God's commands. Once again, the legalist one would say, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And the whole understanding, the context here is a growth in relationship, a growth in obedience. So no matter where you find yourself this morning, There's a deeper calling, a higher place to go with God. I don't care where you're at. God's saying you can always come to know me more. If we think we've come to know all we can about God, we're kidding ourselves, right? The depth of his beauty and knowledge and grace and compassion and love, his his majesty, oh, that we would know that more. This then provides increasingly clear evidence as we move with God, this growing obedience. And when we walk daily with Christ, He perfects our walk as we go, grow with Him. It's not, you do this and I think you're going to be great. It's not some days Jesus goes, some days you just aggravate me. You know? No! He helps us, perfects our walk. To say we know and love God is one thing. Love for God is not abstract or mystical. Love is real and practical. It finds expression in a responsive obedience. And simply put, to love God is to obey and serve God. And obedience that we're called to helps us in two ways. One, the proof of evidence that we know God in our progressive obedience. And secondly, as we obey, we grow in our relationship with Him. And the understanding is in keeping His commandments Not just starting to, but continuing to. And God's word proclaims that in this process, he loves us. See, when we struggle with people sometimes, or feel like we've hurt them or they've hurt us, we question how we really feel about them. God never does that. God says he loves you, and it's a startling truth. We delight in it. We saw some amazing verses when we studied Christ's high priestly prayer that he was praying to the Father, not the least of John 17, 23. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Oh, and by the way, that you love them as much as you love me. How much do you think the Father loved the Son? Do you have any way to define that? And he says, the Father loves you as much as he loves the Son much as the Son loves the Father, which is perfect love. We need to hear that. We need to believe it. It's a vastly important that the truth goes beyond head knowledge. And we want to hear that. We want to know it. We want to believe it. The Bible says it. You know, Jesus loves me this I know because the Bible told me so. But it's more than just head knowledge. It's knowing it. Jesus loves you. I love John. I'm the apostle that Jesus loved. What an attitude. We desire to see the expression of God's love for us in truth, head knowledge, yes, but in real ways as well. We hunger for real and tangible ways of Him moving in our lives, hearing Him, Him helping us, healing us, answering us, teaching us. The truth is we want God to do more then say he loves us. We want God to show he loves us. 
we want God to do. If you question that, just listen to your prayers. Lord Jesus, I need this. Lord Jesus, do this. Oh, I love you, Lord Jesus, but also I need this. Oh, and by the way, my kids over here need this. Or my grandchildren. We want God to do. We want him to show us tangible ways that he loves us, and he understands that. We want God to do. But he's asking the same thing from you and me. That's not hard to understand. That's not hard to understand. And this high-sounding expression, fellowship with God, has down-to-earth expression and obedience. There's a practical realization not found in mystical adoration. There is a practical realization of walking with God that's not found in some mystical adoration. Oh, I love God, yeah. This is a real application in very real lives. It's obedience. It's, it's walking as Christ walked. It's walking in the light as he is in the light. It's walking in the same light that Christ is. It's not just following, this is what Jesus did, so I'm going to do it. No, it's walking present tense in the light that he's in, walking with you. It's walking the light with Christ. And Jesus always walked in obedience to the Father, and to be certain, it wasn't always easy. But it was always possible. And the Scripture makes it clear that Jesus was able to do it by the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit with the God's, the Father's presence and love. The same thing we do. I mean, obedience is at the basis of true Christianity, but it's also the foundation of our growth in Christ. Jesus is looking for more than just lip service. Proclaiming a love for God, but walking in continual disobedience, Scripture calls that lie and the person a liar. But in the midst of all this, we need to see this wonderful, wonderful promise again. 1 John 2, 4 says, He who says, I know him, does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. For this we know that we are in him. I want you to look closely at the contrast here. There is the one who is a liar, and the one who has God's love perfected in him or her. A progressive work of completeness. The one whose love for God and God's love in them is perfected, made complete. The one who walks in the light and walks in obedience is the one who makes a practice of knowing God. And life application commentary addresses it and helps it. So if you've taken a little vacation in your head there for a minute, thinking about the burgers and the cookies that are out there, come back. I'm just telling you, because I want you to hear this. The words reach perfection here must be held up against John's earlier statement that true believers will not claim to be without sin. God considers believers to be perfect because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross on their behalf, yet they will not be completely perfect until Christ returns to take them to his eternal kingdom. Believers cannot reach perfection through their own efforts. Only God can do this, working in them and through them to help them become more perfect until the day after this life when we make them completely perfect. So reach perfection refers to a continuing state of growing and maturing, not a final destination. This growing and maturing process reaches fulfillment, however, as the believers learn and practice obedience to God's word. I know that's a handful, but what a thing of beauty. We're never going to be perfect that we stand on the other side of glory, in glory. But that doesn't mean that we give it up now. There's a growing perfection. The two paths are set before us. The path the world is on, which is the path of darkness and rebellion. But there is a path of pain and destruction in the world. That path is a lie. The path the world is on compared to the path that God is offering. And God's path is full of light, life, truth, and peace, love and compassion, understanding. When you understand the difference, there's only one right choice. Choose life. Choose God. Choose to follow the truth. I remind you that we started out with Scripture that talks about we're in this together. This is all about fellowship as well. 
because we get kind of caught up with it and go, well, I can do better than so-and-so, or I have my own walk. It's part of being together. Iron sharpens iron. We're encouraged by each other. We're encouraged by each other. We hate to see other people fail or fall, but sometimes in the reality of it, we can see ourselves in that. We're not perfect people, but if we love God and love God together, that's part of the purpose of this church. Fellowship with the saints and fellowship with the Father and the Son of who they're hanging around with. What a privilege. Like the worship team to come forward. There's no greater privilege than knowing God, having fellowship with him, God's kind of fellowship. Our culture, we talk about all the time, is on an ever-darkening path. We're called to be salt and light in the world. We have a call on life. You have a call on your life. You're called to impact your world for God. And the closer you draw to God, the more you spin in his light, the brighter you'll shine for Jesus. In a world, this is amazing here, because we talked a lot about the contrast of the fallen world and the liar and all that. In a world that rejects God, that killed the truth, God still proclaims his love for them. Prophet Jeremiah reveals a wonderful promise and proclamation from God. Jeremiah 9.24, For those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me, and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love, and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. God who has unfailing love delights in justice and righteousness. He calls us to walk in his light, his love, his righteousness. He recognizes it as a process. The process begins by following the truth. Obedience brings fellowship, and fellowship, it says, brings tremendous joy. He writes, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. We read some of these things and say, oh, this is a convicting section of Scripture. He says, understand while we're writing it that you have this fullness of joy. And then finally, John 8, 31, we all know it. Jesus said to the disciples who believed him, if you bind my word, you are my disciples of seed indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.